In tonight's video, we're going to sing Kumbaya. And I'm going to do this video while I'm drinking. And I'm going to drink it there. Hey everybody, welcome to my video introducing the Kodak Brownie Hawkeye Flash. And as you can see, I am lucky enough to have four of these in my possession. So, here's one that I painted white and blue because I thought it would look really cool, put a hole in in the process, that kind of screws it up. But it's still light tight, fortunately, I just need to fix that hole. Here's the oldest one I have, it's got a metal wheel on it, and we'll go through some of these differences in the video. Here's the standard one, and here's one that I, if you've seen my video and it's linked in the description, and if I forget to link it, please send me a comment saying I'm a doofus. Uh, I did a video showing how to flip the lens on a Kodak Brownie Hawkeye. This is the one I used for that, which is why it says flip on the shutter button. Um, rather, flip on the um, bulb button. At any rate, so this is a Kodak Brownie Hawkeye flash for the purposes of this video. I'm just going to use these two for right now. This is your standard Brownie Hawkeye flash. This is the way most of them look. They have a plastic knob on the side. Uh, the Brownie Hawkeye Flash was a toy box roll film camera. It took 6 centimeter by 6 centimeter or 6 by 6 format images. Uh, outside of the logical part of the world, 6 by 6 is 2 and a quarter by 2 and a quarter inches. It used 620 film. Now a handful of these can also use 120 film to load, but you need a 620 uh, spool to take up. Only one of my four is like that. I honestly don't know what the difference is between any of these um, that would allow some of them to take 120 as a loading source and some of them not. Typically, if you have this, you've got to re-spool 120 film onto 620. And if I forget to link to that video that I, uh, in my description, please send me a comment saying I'm a doofus and forgot to do that. This camera has no light meter. It has one shutter, uh, technically has two shutter speeds, instant and bulb. Instant. Bulb. Bulb is you hold it down, as long as you hold this down, then the shutter will remain open, and you lift that up to do bulb. We'll, we'll show it, look a little bit more at that in the video, later in the video. It has a viewfinder coverage of approximately 85%. Uh, I couldn't find that anywhere online, so what I did was test the viewfinder with some images, and I lined up uh, a, a square in the viewfinder, and then when I got the film back, went back to figure out how much over, uh, how much extra there was on the image. It was about 85%. Um, in hindsight, it would have been easier just to do some maths and figure it out, and I could have done that, but I didn't. At any rate, because uh, I'm not good at maths. It has, the viewfinder has 33% magnification, meaning that the image that you see in the viewfinder up here is 33% of the size of the image that's going to be on the negative. Uh, the, it the one shutter speed we talked, I talked about, it's not, they're not evenly calibrated and with age and time they're slightly different. So even my four uh, Hawkeye flashes have slightly different shutter speeds, but they range from 130th to 145th of a second. Uh, most of mine are on the slower end of that. Uh, they, the, fo the viewfinders, back to that, have a, a plain focusing screen inside. Uh, there's no grid, nothing fancy, they're very basic. And they have a flash sink right here. You screw it in and then this is the flash sink. And they have an actual flash that would hold on to in the side and they used uh, flash bulbs, which you can't get anymore. There, there are a couple videos out there that explain how to take the flash unit and revise, or uh, to modify, that's the word I'm looking for, modify, the camera to use a modern xenon flash. Uh, the timing is just off. The flash bulbs work differently than the modern flashes, so the timing's off if you just figure out a way to rewire it, to plug it into it. Uh, you have to actually go in and do some work. I don't know how to do it. I've never done it. But if you're interested in doing that, there are some videos. And I, I uh, know that if you do that, there's a chance you might ruin your camera. But these are like five bucks a pop. So if you're going to ruin a camera, this is the one to do it on. So a little bit about these camera, mo this camera model's history. They started off, uh, there was the Brownie Hawkeye. 
and it didn't have these ports on it, and it couldn't take a flash, it was just the Hawkeye. And then they added the flash after a year or two into it, I think I might have that written down. The, the Brownie Hawkeye was made from 1949 to 1951, and the Brownie Hawkeye Flash was made from uh, 1950 until 1961. And the oldest Brownie Hawkeye Flashes have a metal film take-up wheel right here, and the lock is on the opposite side. So this is, the, this is the lock over here, this is the lock over here. They're on opposite sides of the camera. The wheel's metal versus plastic. As far as I know, those are the only design differences uh, between the older ones and the newer ones. These cameras were made in Rochester, New York, Canada, and France. Those are the three locations. I don't think there's any way, in fact, at least I haven't been able to find any way uh, in the research I've done on these to determine whether these were made in Rochester, Canada, or France. Uh, I don't believe that any of mine indicate where they were made. Um, I could be completely wrong. No, I'm not. None of them say where they were made. Um, so my assumption is that they were all made, all of my four were made in Rochester, but I probably won't ever know. So these models were preceded by various uh, Kodak Brownie cameras and Kodak Hawkeye cameras. There were two different lines, Brownies and Hawkeyes. They were concurrent with myriad other Kodak cameras over their 12-year their production life. And they were followed by basically everything that Kodak didn't make as a direct replacement. <laughs> so, or, uh, anyway, so Kodak, they were followed by basically nothing and everything. Kodak did not make a direct replacement for the Brownie Hawkeye Flash when they discontinued it. Uh, so this was really the end of its end of this uh, life. But there have been other other makes and models similar to this, and uh, Kodak continued to make cameras of similar quality and style for a long time. Okay, so for the features, we're going to start on the top of the camera here, and you can see the first thing that we've got is the handle, and these are plastic or vinyl handles. You can see my white one didn't even have a handle. It, the handle came broken on it. As, as if, they get older, it tends to dry out and crack. But a lot of these, uh, I've only ever seen a couple of them that don't have the handle, so typically they, they do. The uh, Up here is the lock, and you just turn the lock to take the camera out, and this is where you load the film, and that's how you get into the camera to, to load and unload the film. And you've got the viewfinder up here. Oh, look, and you can see a whole bunch of nothing because I don't have any lights on except in the, the studio studio it's really my kitchen counter still <laughs> even in the new apartment it's my kitchen counter still uh, then we've got the bulb switch going from instant shutter speed to bulb they call it long on the front of some of them and bulb on the fronts of others and even some of them don't have any text on the front of it so somebody who knows a lot more about the history of these cameras than I do probably could tell you what date range they were made in um, some of these cameras have a date stamp inside that uses a, a cipher called Camerosity. Some of them don't. We'll get into that later in the video. Um, you might, you, there's probably a way to, to, if you had enough of these, to, to match up the, the date stamp with whether or not they have uh, text uh, on the front. So, that's a, so right now it's an instant, there it's a bulb. Over here we've got the shutter release. And that's the entire top of the camera. On the front of the camera, We've got the view, uh, viewing lens, so this is where the light comes in that you see through the viewfinder. And uh, the taking lens, so this is actually, this is a, a twin lens reflex camera. Uh, because you see the image right side up in here, which is why it's called a reflex. And it's got two lenses, which is why it's a twin lens. But it's also a toy camera, and a box camera. It's lots of things. It wears lots and lots of hats. And, uh, and then, oh, you also got the nameplate down here. So that's, that's all that's on the front. Very simple, very clean design. On the camera's back, we've got the exposure counter window. So when the film is coming through here as a roll, what, what you would do is you would watch the dots and then the numbers in here to know when to stop taking up the film onto the take-up spool so you can take your pictures. On the camera's bottom, we've got... Yeah, nothing. And then... Um, 
on the camera's side, on this side we've got the film take-up spool, which turns counterclockwise on all of them. So that's consistent throughout the production range to take up the spool. Some of them have arrows. I don't think the really old ones do, but they don't turn clockwise. If yours turns clockwise, it's broken. And then on this side, we've got the uh, flash. That's where the flash screws in to tight, hold it tight, and that's the flash connection port. Inside the camera, we have the camera lens. Let's see if they're turning to bulb. It'll help if I move that out of the way. There you go, we've got the camera lens, and that's a fixed approximately f11. Uh, it's a fixed aperture, you can't adjust it. And you can see the shutter in there. Um, then we've got the uh, film spool holder. So this is the loading spool, this is where the unused film goes. And then the film take-up spool holder, this is where the film goes after it's been exposed. Uh, we've got the date code on some of them and this one does not have a date code on it. Some of them have a date code that's something like CCCA or RCAR, but it all has to do with the date code of camerosity and camerosity is a cipher. Cam, so C-A-M-E-R-O-S-I-T-Y. So each letter corresponds to a number one through zero. Note that this camera does not take batteries. Everything's completely mechanical. It's operated by a very simple spring, so you don't ever have to worry about batteries leaking in it. That's a good feeling. The flash does take batteries, but I don't have one of those anymore. The, um, let's see, the, like I said, the older models have the winding knob. Then, oh, the meniscus lens in this, it has a very simple single piece of glass meniscus lens in there. And I told you I have one of those flipped. All you have to do is take a few pieces apart. You can flip the meniscus lens inside out and get some pretty nifty uh, bokeh effects on your, on your, uh, in your pictures. Now, you cannot take one of the meniscus lenses, flip it around, put it inside a cardboard tube or plastic tube or something like that, and slap it on the front of your DSLR and get the same effect because you start to get a melty effect towards the margins here, and that's outside the sensor size, even on a full-frame DSLR. I suppose if you had a medium format DSLR, you could do it, uh, but that would be kind of a waste of a ten to $20,000 camera. Okay, so I'll tell you what, if you have a roll of 120 film that you've re-spooled onto some 620 paper with 620 spools, they're all metal, but I do not think there were any plastic 620 spools. I'm going to show you how to load this So you right want to put the take-up spool in first. Typically it should go in and it doesn't really matter which way it goes in. So there's this little pin right here. You might be able to see it. Yeah, there's a little silver pin there. And some of these, it's really hard to do this. Some of them, it's not. It doesn't help anything that I've got the dexterity of a rock with no arms. There we go. So you get the pin into the flange into the hole, rather, in the flange, and then get this in, and then just turn the take-up spool until it clicks into place. Put your thumb in there to help it along the way. And now there's a long end and a short end, or short slot, rather, within the uh, shaft of the 620 spool. So you want to make sure that the long slot is facing this way. It's going to help a lot when we load the film. So we got the 620 film here. This is a similar but simpler process. Just gonna, just gonna force this in here. Dang it! Does not, does not like this. This camera just wants to be retired. It's just it's like I don't want to have film in me anymore. Always have problems with this one. Okay, we're gonna try this again. Like I didn't just mess that up and look, make myself embarrassed. Okay. So you put it in so the longer spike on this side is in first, and then get it clipped in. Here we go. Just feed this around. Now if you use 120 paper, um, some of these, the 120 spool will fit and some of them it won't, like I said. If, you, uh, if the 120 spool does, that's not a guarantee that it will actually work in the camera, because the 120 paper is a little bit wider than the 620. 
And so what happens is that it gets caught up here and gets flipped, frayed around the edges and puts, puts a lot of extra friction on the advanced knob. And I've actually, I actually tore a piece of 120 backing paper in half doing that, which didn't really help the photos turn out well, if I'm honest. So anyway, you can see here as we put the 620 paper on, we've got this double arrow here. We're going to advance this until the double arrow is here. At this point then, you put the camera back together, lock it in place, and now it's light tight and you're set to advance the film. Let's take up the film. Here comes the arrow. That, that's the arrow that we were just looking at. That's the center bar of it. And... There's about a foot of material here, so it takes a little while to take it all up. Ooh, arrow. It's letting us know that something's coming. Dot, 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 dots. Series of dots. Now we're set to take frame one, and the film is from here to here. I don't actually have any film in this, just backing paper. So I'm okay taking it off. Now you can see that there's different... This is the one we're looking at. This is for 6x6. Six six. As we advance it, you can see that the backing paper has different numbers. 645 up here on what's on the left, 6 by 9 down here. So as we take it up, it goes this way. Now because this can't turn counterclockwise, the take-up knob cannot turn counterclockwise. As, whatever you take it to, if you overshoot a frame accidentally, you're stuck there. You've overshot the frame, and you'll need to compensate on the rest of your frames to make up for that gap. So don't overtake your frame, overwind your frames if you can avoid it. And as you wind this, as you get later and later in numbers, it takes fewer turns to advance the film. So because, because the um, diameter of the film and paper on the take-up spool is getting bigger, so it advances more quickly. Just be aware of that. The first time I used this, I didn't realize it by the end. The first time I used a 120 camera, I didn't realize it by the end of the uh, roll. I only had to re turn the knob maybe one and a half, two and a half, three times, not eight or nine. So it keeps going, and you can see the uh, different numbers here for the different formats. With the 6x6 that this takes, and all of the Brownie Hawkeye flashes were 6x6, the 6x6 you get 12 exposures on a roll. So we're almost done, which is good because I'm sure that this is not the most riveting YouTube video footage you've ever seen. So once you get past 12, you just keep on rolling. Don't take the camera. Don't take the camera back off. You still want to have it on even now. There we go. You still want to have it on. And once you've completely taken up the film on the spool, and you'll be able to tell that because the back of the camera on, it will look like this. Uh, just, just nothing. Now, once you've taken up, the, you've entirely taken this up comes out a lot more easily than it goes in, doesn't it? So that's why I think that this camera just wants to be retired. It's just it's, it's happy to get rid of film as quickly as possible, even though there's not even actual film in this. So at any rate, you can you want because this is such a basic camera, you can advance the film too far. You can advance it not far enough. And you can also take multiple exposures very quickly without advancing it because there's no multiple exposure prevention built into this unit. So earlier in the video, I said that this has a fixed aperture of f11, and I misspoke. It has a fixed aperture, that's correct, but it has a fixed aperture of f14.5 or f16, and that depends on how you measure it. My guess is that the aperture was intended to be f16, because that's a standard stop, f14.5, uh, width of opening times focal distance. So if you have a 100 millimeter lens and your opening is 50 millimeters, that's an f2. If you have a 100 millimeter lens and your opening is 10 millimeters, it's f10. So this opening, uh, I, m I measured it and it multiplied, if this is an 80 millimeter lens, which I believe it is, then it was f16. And I say it's an 80 millimeter lens because it's a standard lens on 6x6, six six, and 6x6 six six is. 70, maybe it's 75 millimeters and 75 millimeters. Anyway, the distance from the lens to the film is equal to the diagonal distance on the film. And I'm not good enough at maths to be able to tell you what that diagonal distance is without looking it up. And I'm using my phone as my uh, crutch 
Uh, I mean, as my outline, so I can't just use my phone and pretend like I'm good at maths right now. I'm sorry. So I want to give you some tips for how to use these cameras, and I'll bring this one back in because we're winding up here. We're getting close to the finish. I want to bring you some, uh, so you sh give you some tips on how to use these cameras. So in general, they focus from about 10 or 20 feet to infinity, and uh, I'm sorry, they focus from. Seven or uh, seven feet to infinity, ten to twenty feet. That range is the lens's sweet spot. So whatever is ten to twenty feet from the camera is going to be the most in focus of whatever you're taking a picture of. Uh, so before you take before you test one of these out, you want to verify that your shutter works correctly. You want to uh, test it both in instant and bulb mode long, nothing, nothing, nothing. So you want to test it in both instant and, and bulb mode. Uh, you want to load and unload the film inside with your lights low or dim. They don't have to be off, but low or dim is, is, is preferable because the paper around the spool's edge can leak a little bit of light. If you're outside and changing film, that's okay, you can do that, but you want to do it in the shade. If you don't have ready shade like a tree or a building, you can always crouch and uh, use your own shadow as, as a little bit of shade to change the, the film out. But one thing to remember is that these are old cameras and today's film is more red sensitive than the old films. So you want to avoid direct red light uh, on the camera. Or direct light on the camera back, especially. So don't hold this up so that the red red window is pointing at the sun because you will fog your film. Uh, also, these cameras can leak light. None of mine do that. I've never had a problem with these leaking light. So uh, to avoid the red dot leakage, what you can do is make a flap. And I've done that on a few of these because these will fog my film if I if I don't do it. And so what I do is I take a piece of credit card because I love cutting up the credit cards or other, other type of store card or whatever it is. And I put that over it with a piece of scotch tape and then I fold one end of the scotch tape to itself and then pull it back like a trap door. And I can advance it and then close it again. Um, you can use anything. You could, you could use some old backing paper from 120 film to do that as well and some electrician's tape instead of scotch tape. Um, it's not as critical with, with these because they do have the red window but you do still want to have some kind of additional light block. You can use aluminum foil. That would work well too. It's light proof. Um, so on sunny days, ISO 100 film works well. However, indoors, that's not really going to work very well. Inside, this is not probably your best camera option. Uh, even uh, 400 ISO film might be a little bit slow. Uh, in general, 160 ISO is reliable for most situations in the sun. That comes straight out of the manual. Um, you can still get Portra, Kodak Portra 160 ISO film. And you can also always use one 100 ISO and then um, uh, develop it as 160 ISO. But I've used 100 and developed it straight as 100 and had no problems with it whatsoever. 400 ISO film can work okay in the late evening. Uh, this camera's image slides are softer than its image tops, and I don't understand why that is. Cause it's, a, it's a square image, and it's a circular lens. So the lens should be casting the image circle evenly over the image, but the sides are a little bit, a little bit softer than the tops. That's just a fact. So, bearing that in mind, if you want to have a picture where the top and bottom are softer or the sides are not as soft, you can just turn the camera sideways and you get the same, same uh, perspective because it's a square image. And that's one, one trick you, that's worth knowing and one limitation of this camera that's also worth knowing. You can also use filters on this camera. Uh, it does not have a filter adjustment. So what you would need to do is hold your filter up to the lens and then take the picture. Uh, you can use a polarizer, just hold the polarizer in front of your viewing lens, get it set to where you want it to be, move it down, and take the picture. So there are a lot of fun things you can do with these cameras. You can flip the lens like I did with this one. You should check out that video. You can paint them 
like I did with this one, uh, the painting job on that aluminum really turned out not great. So I'm going to hide that back there for a little bit longer. Um, you can convert the flash to X flash. I've never done that. I don't have an intention to do it. Uh, you could also, one thing that I'm going to, uh, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try on a, the next one of these that I get a destructive modification, uh, more so than painting it. It, the flit lens flip is completely reversible. I'm going to uh, get another one of these at some point and I'm going to route the aperture opening. So the aperture opening is only f16 because as you can see there's that metal disc in there and it limits the aperture opening. Well if that was gone that would probably be f11 which would change the way the disc camera functions in unpredictable and interesting, interesting ways. Uh, you could also swap out the spring in here to put in a stronger spring to give yourself a shorter shutter speed if you wanted to use faster films. I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I couldn't tell you how strong the spring needs to be or what kind it is or where to get it, but in theory, that should totally be doable. There's a couple things, though, even though these are toy cameras, you don't want to do because they are still cameras and they are still fairly precise instruments, and that is you don't want to touch the shutter. Uh, even though they're very simple mechanical shutters, you can still damage the shutter mechanism by touching it when it's opening and closing. You definitely do not want to touch the mirror in here. If you take this apart to paint it or to fix it or anything like that, to clean it up, a lot of these come and they're very dirty inside, so they're very easy to take apart with just taking, off the, taking out the screws. If you do that, don't touch the mirror because your finger, the oils on your fingers can desilver it and ruin the mirror. Don't leave the camera in your car because you, the heat can damage it. It's less susceptible to damage than modern cameras are because there's less grease, but there is still grease and it. You could ruin your, your camera that way, or at least make it so you have to take it apart and clean it. Don't store it in a plastic container or plastic bag because you can get moisture in there and get fungus, which will ruin your camera very quickly uh, over the span of a few months, but it can still ruin it. And don't let your camera get wet. Again, even though this isn't a, is not an electronic camera, there's no electronics within it other than the wire to connect the shutter to the flash, you can still ruin it by getting it wet because it would be, uh, it would rust. So just remember that even though this is a fun camera, and it is, it is a lot of fun to use. These are very fun cameras. I, I absolutely love it whenever I take one of these out. They are, all, they are still precision tools, and they should be handled with care and respect. So if this video was helpful to you, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comments section below, and I'm pretty good about responding to those pretty quickly. Uh, suggestions for other videos, I'm more than happy if I have the technical ability and the equipment to do it to make those videos. Uh, if you want to subscribe, there's a subscribe button there. You should definitely do that, and then you'll be alerted to any time I have a new camera-related video. And one last thing, thank you guys for watching. Kumbaya, my